Well, frequency selective filtering is widely used in signal processing. And what a filter inherently does is to separate. You can think about a coffee filter, which separates the water from the coffee grounds. But when we're doing frequency selective filtering, we're separating signals based on their frequency content. So we have different types of filters. We can look at a low pass filter, which is going to pass the low frequencies and eliminate the high frequencies or block them. A band pass filter, which is going to act on a band of frequencies to pass those and attenuate other frequencies. A high pass filter, which passes high frequencies, as the name implies. You can also talk about band stop filters where we reject a certain band of frequencies and pass all others. And then a notch filter is like a band stop filter, but it has a much narrower stop region. So in all these cases, we're using the frequency of the signal to select whether it gets passed or attenuated by the filter. There are other types of filters where a specific shape or frequency response shape is desired to implement for a system, such as when we do an inverse system and if we're trying to mimic a differentiator in discrete time, we have a different type of filter. We're going to concentrate here on frequency selective filtering. So an ideal filter, based on the diagrams we just looked at, an ideal filter takes a signal, x of n, and if it lies in the band that's going to be passed, the pass band, then it's going to go through the filter with, at worst, a delay of n naught samples. Okay, we consider a delay it doesn't change the shape of the signal, and that's a rather mild effect, so usually a delay is considered distortionless. Now, if the signal doesn't lie in the pass band B, then the filter is supposed to block it or completely zero out the output in response to that input. Now this idea of a delay in time corresponds to a linear shift of phase in frequency. So this ideal filter is going to have unit gain in its pass band. We'll denote that here by B, and this is a band pass case that I'm sketched out here. And then in the phase characteristics, it's going to have a linear phase with a slope of minus n naught in the band of interest B. Now, ideal filters like this can't be implemented for a variety of reasons, one of which is they generally going to be non-causal and non-computable. So with a practical filter, we have several different deviations from these ideal characteristics. Typically, we're going to have some variable gain in the passband. It won't be exactly one, but it might vary a bit. We're not going to have zero gain in the stop band. We won't be perfectly attenuating signals that are out of band. There'll be a transition band. In other words, a range of frequencies where the filter is allowed to transition from passband to stop band. And then finally, we may have nonlinear phase, depending on the type of filter that we choose. So practical filters have these four different types of deviation. To look at the gain or magnitude of the filter, we can specify that in terms of something known as a tolerance diagram, which I've sketched out here for a bandpass filter. So in this bandpass filter, the pass band is between omega P1 to omega P2. And in that range, we're saying that the gain of the filter has to be somewhat close to 1, it can get a little bigger than 1 by a value delta P1. It can be a little smaller than 1 by a value delta P2. So it has to lie in this range indicated by the blue shading here. Then in the stop band, we're going to say that it has to attenuate signals at least to a level of delta sub S. So the largest the gain can be in the stop band is delta sub S is indicated by this shaded blue area here in both the lower and the upper stop bands. And then there's a transition band. So the edge of the pass band and the edge of the stop band are separated to allow for the filter response to go from pass to stop band. We can write this out analytically, this illustration of this diagram. We say that in the stop band, 
we require that the magnitude response of the filter be less than delta s and in this particular bandpass case that would be for magnitude of omega less than omega s1 and then the magnitude of omega between omega sub s2 and pi. Then in the pass band we're going to require that the magnitude response of the filter lie between 1 minus delta p2 and 1 plus delta p1 and that's going to hold in this particular bandpass case when the magnitude of omega is between omega p1 and omega p2. And then finally in the transition band we sometimes say that we don't care what the response is because we're going to allow it to be somewhat arbitrary. There's two of them in this bandpass filter case. We've got magnitude of omega between omega s1 and omega p1 on the lower transition band. Then the upper transition band is from omega p2 to omega s2. Now it's not that we don't care because we wouldn't want the gain in the transition band to be some really large value but we're going to allow the filter flexibility in how it transitions from the pass to the stop band. Now filter phase specifications are typically in one of three categories. One can say that we require a linear phase filter so that we're introducing no phase distortion at most the time delay and that leads us down a particular path for designing the filter. Another approach is to say, well, I'm going to take whatever phase response I get for the particular magnitude response I've chosen, in which case we say that we're not really concerned with the phase response. And sometimes phase response isn't all that important. For example, with audio, uh, the human ear is relatively insensitive to deviations from linear phase. Yet a third case is to say that we want to have zero phase. And this is only possible if we have data or signals that have been stored in a computer and we're going to filter them in a non-causal fashion. We'll talk about that in a separate lecture, how to implement a zero phase filter. I'm going to wrap this up with an example and I'm going to assume that my discrete time filter, which I'll denote with system function h of z, is embedded between a sampling operation and a reconstruction operation so that the discrete time filter is intended to impart a filtering characteristic to a continuous time signal. So we have some effective frequency response of this overall system represented by H effective of F. We'll assume that our sampling rate is 10 kilohertz or the sampling interval T is 10 to the minus 4 seconds. This is going to be a low pass filter, so for frequencies less than 2 kilohertz, we're going to require the magnitude response of the overall chain to be between 0 0.99 and 1. And then above 3 kilohertz, we'll assume that's our stop band, we'll require the gain to be less than 0 0.01. So this represents about 40 dB of attenuation. And for the purposes of this example, we're going to find our specs on the discrete time filter that would satisfy this. However, we'll assume that our sampling and our reconstruction are ideal. Well, the key step here is in recalling that the relationship between discrete time frequency omega and continuous time frequency f can be obtained using the sampling interval t as omega is equal to 2 pi f times t. So this implies that the edge of our pass band at 2 kilohertz corresponds to a discrete time frequency at 2 pi over 5, and the edge of our stop band at 3 kilohertz corresponds to a discrete time frequency of 3 pi over 5. Our tolerance diagram for this particular filter looks something like this, where for frequencies less than 2 pi over 5, we require that the gain of the filter be between 0.99 and 1, and then for frequencies greater than 3 pi over 5, we require that the gain of the filter be less than 0 0.01. So when we actually proceed to design filters, knowing what the specifications are and being able to express them in this sort of format is essential to obtaining a filter that satisfies our goals.